In this section, we're going to be looking at sinus bradycardia. So we're carrying on with our sinus node arrhythmias, and in particular, in this section, we are looking at sinus bradycardia. Oops, my apologies, sinus bradycardia. So number two of the five. Now, sinus bradycardia can occur naturally. So in our seasoned athletes, they have a lower resting heart rate. When we sleep, we can have a lower resting heart rate. So this is not always a rhythm that creates a lot of concern. Again, we're looking for stable versus unstable. So let's just look at a few things that would cause our patient to be unstable. In terms of the most common pathological cause, we're looking at that inferior MI. Now in the last section, when we talked about the respiratory sinus arrhythmia, an inferior MI may actually cause that rhythm. It can also cause a bradycardiac rhythm on your ECG tracing, a sinus bradycardia. So lead to, and we're looking at that lead to, remember this is an overall picture of the heart. In particular, it's looking at the electricity as it's moving from the SA node down to the apex of the heart. And so lead to is considered a really good inferior look at the heart. And if it's an inferior MI, we're going to get a good picture of it in that lead. Now, just of note, if you have a 12 lead in front of you, and I will show you this in a minute, you would look for ST elevation in lead two if it's a cardiac event. We talked about the ST segment before, so ST elevation greater than one little box above isoelectric line. But you would also look for it in lead three. That's another inferior view of the heart and the augmented vector foot lead. That's another inferior view of the heart. So you would see the same changes in all three of those leads. Now, interesting, there's also reverse or reciprocal changes. So instead of elevation, I would see ST depression in the leads that are opposite. And so for this case, we're looking at lead one, the augmented vector left, V5 and V6. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Now the right coronary artery, I just wanna come back here quickly. The right coronary artery does feed the SA node. So if there's any trauma, damage, occlusion in that artery, we can certainly see a sinus bradycardi bradycardic rhythm. So in this picture, I've got two different sinus bradycardiac rhythm strips. And I brought in two for a very particular reason. So when we compare the top to the bottom, the isoelectric line I've drawn in here for you, and we can see that there's, well, there's not so much a P wave here, a little bit of a, maybe they had just converted here because that's a T wave and then all of a sudden we're into a QRS. So it's either an early beat or they converted here. But we see this QRS nice and narrow and then a T wave, a P wave, QRS, T wave. And we can see the P wave in the remaining rhythm. But what I have pointed out here is this QRS, remember it usually comes down to a negative deflection and then it comes back up to the isoelectric line before it makes the T wave. This is what we call a slurred J point. And I talked about this before that it could be a normal physiological finding in a younger adult. But if this was a 60 year old smoking, we'd be a little bit more concerned. So here we kind of have a slurring of the QRS going into the T wave. And as a result, our ST segment is actually elevated by one box or more as we go along this strip. So this would be an ST elevation MI question mark. This is where the doctor comes and looks at the full picture of the 12 lead. And I'm gonna show you this in a second to identify if this is a normal physiological finding or if it's pathological. On the bottom, here we have another bradycardia. So we have a P wave, QRS, and you see how it comes back to isoelectric line, T wave. And we do have a little bit of a reversal here, and this can be a physiological U wave, we call it. I don't really talk about that in this course, but um, just to note that that may be, uh, it could be a pathological thing or it may be a normal physiological thing. But what I really want to highlight here for you is the difference in the ST segment. So if we go back a slide, I did mention that what we wanna look for here is in lead two, three, and augmented vector foot, they should also show elevation of the ST segment. Just as important is the reciprocal leads, lead one, AVL, V5, and V6, they should show depression, and that would help me diagnose an inferior myocardial infarction. So let's head over to that next picture. I'm gonna give you their 12 lead here quick. I know this is not a 12 lead course, 
but here I want to highlight the importance of it. So in green, I have got my lead one, my augmented left, V5 and V6. So these are reciprocal ones. So I should see ST depression happening here. But when I look at this, I still see elevation. And then it's that isoelectric line. Iso, that's pretty close. Here I see elevation again and V6, I see elevation again. So I'm not seeing that depression. Next, I want to look at leads two, three, and augmented vector foot because there should also be elevation in each one of these. And in fact, I see that in the lead two. Lead three is a little bit dampened, but I do see some here. And augmented vector foot looks pretty, pretty good. So this to me would show that this is not an inferior MI, that this might just be a normal physiological finding in this patient. That is why one, our lead two is so important too, that we can converse and dialogue with the people who are looking at the full 12 lead. Other causes for a bradycardic presentation. Myocarditis, so infection of the myocardium, that's that muscle layer of the, the heart that we talked about way back a few modules ago. And the most common cause of that is a viral infection. And we certainly got a lot of viral infections going around. Autoimmune disorders, radiation therapy, and drugs can also cause an infection of the muscles of the heart. Ischemic heart disease and vascular heart disease are also things to consider. Now, other potential causes to look at? Electrolytes. We talked about action potentials for a reason. We're looking at our potassium, our cal calcium, and sodium levels because those are the three main players in action potentials. And if they are in deficient volume, we will have likely a slower heart rate. Hypothermia, that's going to slow the time that it takes to depolarize. Those muscles are cold, just like us in the morning. Ugh, stiff, cold, we don't want to move very fast. Same thing with the heart. Hypothyroidism, so that's going to reduce heart rate because we're no longer getting that stimulus for metabolism. Hypothyroidism, everything is slow, slowed down. Vagal nerve stimulation, we just talked about this in the last section. When the vagal nerve is stimulated, excited, we have a decrease in heart rate. And I have here bearing down because this we talk about a lot in particular populations when they go to the washroom and they're pushing hard to have a stool movement, the bowel movement, then they can actually become unconscious and faint for a little bit. Again, inter increased intracranial pressure. So we saw this in the last section. We see it again here. And why I bring this forward is I really just want to highlight that it isn't one diagnosis that will result in one rhythm. There's a whole host of rhythms that could be the cause, and it's really important to source out the cause of your arrhythmia to find the right treatment. Now, there are medications that can also cause a slow heart rate, and these are common medications that we give in the workplace. You'll see here that we've got, well, lithium is not listed here. We're, we'll talk about lithium in a second. Let's look at the ones that are listed here in yellow, our beta blockers, our calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. All of these will influence the movement of electro, uh, electrolytes and it can slow the conduction rate between the SA node and AV node. Now this is particularly focused up here in the right and left atrium. Lithium, on the other hand, is going to alter the exchange at the SA node and it can actually cause hypothyroidism, which is another cause of sinus bradycardia. So when we have patients on lithium, we need to really be watching them for signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. So next, next, let's take a look at what a sinus bradycardiac rhythm strip looks like. As we look at this here, we can still see our P wave, our QRS complex, and our T wave. But then there's a longer gap in between each complex in itself. And that is really the signature mark of a sinus bradycardia is that the ECG waveforms and intervals will be normal with the exception of rate. Comparing this with normal sinus rhythm, up top here you can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six R wave, so that's a rate of 60 beats per minute. And on the bottom I only have four, so I have 40 beats per minute. So sinus bradycardia is, is, is defined as less than 60 beats per minute. Tongue twister. But wait, could this be junctional? Could this be a block? I gotta do all of my assessment here to make sure. When we look at our sinus bradycardia's waveforms, we'll see everything is normal except 
the rate. So our atrial and ventricular rhythm will be normal. When you map these out, they are predictable. They will happen at this spot. And the rate for atrial and ventricular will be the same, but they will be both less than 60. Again, P wave is round and upright. There's one for every QRS, and then there's a T wave. All of our intervals will be normal, and our ST segment will be flat. Treatment for bradycardia. Now again, symptomatic, asymptomatic. If they have no symptoms, so I'm pretty sure I've already told the story about the guy with the heart rate in the 30s. He was fine, I was not. We monitor and observe. We keep them on the monitor, we check in with them, we do their LOCs, their vital signs, look at their oxygen saturations, do repeat ECGs. The key is we need to identify what the cause is. What is going on? Is this a drug? Is this an illness? Is this a normal physiological response because they run 25 kilometers every day? And we, we consult cardiology to make sure that we don't miss anything. Now, if they are symptomatic, this means we go back to those signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output, changes in the LOC in the nervous system, changes in the respiratory rate, changes in our cardiovascular system, decreased output, sweaty, fainting, all that stuff. We want to increase the heart rate, so we're going to give atropine. Atropine 0.5 milligrams, and we give that as a bolus, boom, IV, and then every three to five minutes after that, if needed, up to a maximum of three milligrams. Alternatively, we can give dopamine infusion or an epinephrine infusion. We still need to consult cardiology and we're going to consider pacing our patients. So there is an acronym that we use for bradycardia. It's called PACE. And the P stands for PACE, which means we're going to get that machine, put the pads on, and we're going to deliver electricity at a required minimum rate. So 60 beats per minute. If their heart doesn't beat, we're going to poke it so that it does. A stands for atropine, that's the medication we're gonna to use to boost up the heart rate. C stands for to consider epinephrine and dopamine. So why is atropine our first choice? It's because it inhibits the vagus nerve. Now this is really important because if you give atropine and nothing changes, then the vagus nerve is not the problem. This is, a, it, this is effective in about 28% of the cases where we have an increase, where we will get an increase in heart rate. So for example, let's just say your patient is in cardiogenic shock, which means that there isn't enough fluid to fill the pump. If I give atropine, we're not going to see a change in cardiac output because I don't have fluid, right? So we need to make sure that we're addressing the actual cause. We give atropine and there is no effect. We may be looking at something else. Now dopamine stimulates the dopaminergic and beta-1 receptors. Um, oh, I guess I have a different slide in here. So dopamine works at a different site in the cell. It's focusing on those dopin, dopaminergic and beta-1 receptor sites. Now, we, there are some different dosing here to pay attention to. And if we give doses greater than 10 mics per kilo per minute, it will stimulate the alpha receptors, which cause vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction will improve our cardiac output. It's often used for hypotension, so we need to increase our blood pressure. But, 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 if there is low fluid, you need to correct the fluid deficit before you give this. So we may be giving a fluid bolus as well. Epinephrine will stimulate beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, and it's an agonist to the alpha receptors. So this is going to raise blood pressure and heart rate, which is going to increase cardiac output. It's also going to increase the perfusion to the brain and the heart, the heart itself. Now the caution here is that epinephrine can actually increase the workload on the heart because our heart's gonna be pumping faster. And so if we are worried about a heart attack, that's something we need to weigh in because we don't actually want the heart to work harder. We want the heart to rest so it can heal. Beta one receptors affect heart rate and contractility. Beta two receptors are lung tissue. So smooth muscle dilation, skeletal muscle. So we have one heart, beta one receptors, two lungs, beta two receptors. Alpha one receptors are focused on peripheral vasodilation. And that is why we are focusing all three different areas. 
let's do a quick overview of sinus bradycardia. The SA node is still in charge of the rhythm because we have the P wave. That is how we know SA node is in charge. Round, upright P wave, SA node. Everything is slowed down. So we have a slower than normal rate, less than 60 beats per minute. It may or may not be symptomatic. We've got to find the cause in order to, to treat the main issue. All right, so the next section we're going to look at is sinus tachycardia. We'll see you there.